Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. It's always an honor to have our Mayor here in studio, Mayor Jerry Dehovic, for his monthly update. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Liz. It's my honor to be with you. All right. Well, I know you have lots happening at the city level. We want to get right to it. So um, just talk just in general right now, some of the big issues the council and you are working on. Well, we, we have, uh, it's probably going to be a recurring theme because some of these things uh, take a long time to come to fruition. Um, you know, one of the big things that we're dealing with right now, obviously, is the recruitment of a city manager. And I think we're going to get in that in a little more detail in a minute. Uh, union negotiations are going to start. We finally have our uh, status quo MOU, what they also refer to as a baseline MOU, ratified by both the union and the city council at the last meeting. So a negotiation should be starting in sometime in April. I think there are three meetings set and we are going to meet in closed session on that and we can talk about that in a minute. Um, obviously infrastructure, we just had an infrastructure uh, workshop, a special meeting on the 11th, which I think is also on our agenda to talk about. Uh, Marymount, as of late, has become a hot topic. We've oh, yeah. got a couple issues dealing with them. Uh, zone 2 amendments are coming up uh, in very short order, and that has to do with the buildability of lots in the Portuguese Bend area. So that's always a hot button. And uh, we're on the cusp of budget season, so the, the fun and games will begin in, in earnest. But those are, you know, obviously big things. Those are long-term items, um, and that's what we're dealing with. No idle time at City Hall. No. Um, we, in the month of February, you've had two council meetings and actually a special meeting, and so you've had a lot going on, a lot of a lot of topics you're covering. Um, right. Let's just start with the last City Council meeting. One of the agenda items had to do with Marymount College parking lot. What was discussed, and what did the council do in terms of taking action on the parking lot issue? Right. Well, the the parking lot was completed roughly six months ago, as you know, and uh, as part of the CUP process, there's a six month review. And the public um, and any other interested party has the ability to comment. Uh, there were many comments. That was a very healthy staff report. It was about a 300 pager uh, with all the comments and the emails. Uh, but there were some concerns, primarily uh, by the residents uh, in the immediate area and the neighborhoods right around Marymount, as you might imagine, uh, since they're the ones most affected. But a couple issues they brought up were. Um, you know, visual and privacy impacts because that parking lot is very close to people's backyards and it's in their view corridor. Uh, noise issues from people using the parking lot. Uh, lighting impacts, very significant issue. You have um, lower stanchion type lighting around the perimeter of the parking lot. You also have very uh, tall lighting. I think it's 10 or 12 feet in the middle and it puts out a lot of light. So lighting is a concern uh, with the residents because it, it very much affects the semi-rural nature of, of where we live. Um, and lighting has been an issue not only at Marymount, but, you know, down here at uh, uh, PVIC and at mm -hmm. Trump and City Hall, all kinds of lighting is always an issue. And, and at uh, St. John Fisher, by the way. Uh, so we're looking at that. Um, kind of one that you think would be pretty easy to fix is uh, littering and, and the trash effect of people coming and going there. And unfortunately, there have been a handful of students smoking back right. there. I heard a lot about the smoking. The smoking is an issue. And I, I really challenged Dr. Brophy to... Uh, take a very harsh stance with that because uh, we don't we don't need any fires over there. Um, there is there is uh, brush and grass and and you know an errant cigarette butt can can cause a significant amount of damage, both you know loss of property, potentially loss of life. It's it's huge, and I encourage him to take very severe steps uh, in dealing with the smoking issue. Um, and the other final one that was that was a big topic is the the outdoor programs that are going to be uh, held on the parking lot grounds and and there's an additional um, community garden or growth garden that they call it that's now in in this buffer zone between the parking lot and some residents backyard and that was a that was a real real hot button i think Are they calling that an outdoor classroom that i was hearing they, yeah part of that and then and i guess some of the the produce that's going to be grown there is going to be a teaching area and they're going to invite you know kids from some of the local uh, schools and areas and some of the the homes and and uh, uh, philanthropies to come garden here and use the produce for food to feed people, which is a very uh, commendable thing to do. But you know, it's it's right in somebody's backyard, and I think it was unbeknownst to most people. So it was a really, really hot button topic. So after you covered all these topics, in the end, you're not you didn't make any decision about the parking lot. What are you actually trying to figure out? Well, well, we didn't. You know, um, I had made up my mind on certain of the issues. I think these are all 
in my personal opinion, fairly easy to remediate, except maybe the growth garden. We're going to have to take a close look at that. Um, but Marymount felt that, as I mentioned, that staff report was about 300 pages long. Uh, they got it on Friday. It was a holiday weekend, and uh, um, you know they wanted additional time to come back and offer some other suggestions and changes other than what the staff had recommended in the staff report. And and. You know, in trying to be as fair and uh, and uh, impartial and just to listen to everybody, the council thought that that would be okay. So we granted them 60 days to to come back with some some uh, proposals of their own, and we'll weigh that. We'll also weigh the staff's proposals, and in the meantime, we we encourage them to do what they can now without receiving council direction or city direction to make some of these improvements and changes right. to take care of these issues. It's going to be back as an April 1st meeting? That's right. So will there still be public comment period or is that It'll be, yeah, sure. It'll be, it'll be a public hearing and, uh, you know, we will invite the public to come back. We'll, we're very much uh, interested in what Marymount is going to propose and obviously the public's going to get the uh, ability to opine on it. Right. Since we're on the Marymount school subject, Marymount University, um, you, uh, there's another topic that, of course, has been hot uh, that's happening at City Hall regarding what they want to do with their building the athletic field. Right. And I don't know right. if you want to talk about that now since we're on Marymount. Sure. About the fact that, you know, you um, sort of acting as an intermediary was going to, you could coming up with sort of a way to deal with their need for an athletic field and talk about what you were, your approach is and what you were doing. Sure. Um, over the course of years, I've heard that uh, several people have tried to get the city and the school district to work together in some sort of a joint powers arrangement uh, for the use of the Marylist Intermediate School facility. And, um, you know, there, there was uh, a lot of proposals floating around, nothing really caught um, or took off, you know. And, uh, but that was always in the back of my mind, and, and I was thinking that in reading all the detailed documentation uh, about what Marymount is trying to accomplish, uh, and knowing the facility very well at Merrill S, that there might be a solution here that instead of a two-party agreement, maybe we do a tri-party agreement and include Marymount in the mix because they have a beautiful stadium there. You know, some of that's in disrepair, but you know, I went immediately, I, I had a brief meeting with Dr. Brophy and Aaron Lamont, the president of the school board, uh, just to kind of feel out whether or not there was any interest whatsoever. And, and I, I proceeded very cautiously because I didn't have the authority to talk uh, on behalf of the city or the council. Uh, and I don't think, neither did they really. I guess Dr. Brophy could, but you know, he answers to board of trustees and, and mm -hmm. uh, Aaron answers to the school board. Uh, so I just broached the idea, would they be interested in a dialogue? And they said, yeah. So we went back to our respective bodies and said, this is, this is what um, we're thinking we'd like to do. Uh, and that is have a very general dialogue and try to accomplish four things. The first is just even see if there's any, any level of interest, sincere level of interest on the part of the parties. Um, that's going to be goal number one. Number two is we're going to look at whether or not it's feasible to enter into such an agreement. For example, um, you know, there's a lot of legalities involved. You've got a lot of bodies involved. And does the city want to participate? Does maybe Marymount and the school district just want to participate? Just don't know all the, the minutiae yet, but we're going to look at that. And the other one, that's, that's probably very big, is the macro level issues. Can we talk about, um, you know, if, for example, and I don't know this to be, let's say Marymount requires a 30-year agreement and the school board says we can only enter a five or 10-year agreement, then there's not much more to talk about. That's just a very simplistic example. But uh, So we need to talk about macro deal points. And then finally, um, if we can get through all that and we, we figure that, yeah, there's some, there's some merit to this discussion, we might put down a preliminary framework uh, very preliminary framework on, on how this might all work out because it's really going to entail uh, staff uh, from, from all three organizations to come work together and hammer it all, and plus, I'm sure, a lot of attorneys. So you're looking at this as an option rather than having to build, put a new field and add on the facility at Marymount? That's as an option, that's right. And I do also so want to say... thinking outside the box, which is always good. Thinking outside the box. Another option is good. But I do want to throw a, a legal caveat here that, uh, you know, this proposal should not be construed in any way as altering or interfering with the city's process to review or consider Marymount's right. application regarding the athletic field or any other application follow, uh, filed by Marymount. So just to be clear, this is something we, we have a job to do. They do have a CUP revision in, in, uh, in front of us. Um, it was going to be heard in March. That's also now going to be heard in April, which is kind of nice because it gives us a little additional time to have these. It might be probably a handful of meetings with the preliminary discussions. So 
Are you um, excited about this idea? I'm, I'm so excited. I think it's just, you know, what I envision could be a win-win-win for, for everybody. And, you know, the residents, um, the school would have an improved facility there. Marymount would have a, a class, you know, class A state-of-the-art facility at their fingertips. They could probably save money in, in being involved with the improvements there. Um, could serve the community in an even greater way. That's right? exactly right. You know, and you, you know, I went after I had that initial meeting with Dr. Brophy and, and uh, Aaron Lamont. Um, you know, I went over and spent about two and a half, three hours just roaming Merrill S. I was so excited. It sounds like we'll be staying tuned on that one. Absolutely. This, of course, was all happening at your last meeting. Um, some of the other topics, you always been focused on these goal setting exercises that have been going on. Right. And talk about to the residents out there what this is all about, because for the last three meetings at least, You've had a consultant there, you know, help, helping the council structure goals and priorities. Right. As, as I mentioned in our last uh, discussion, um, the city council, when we when we were first seated, this council, this makeup here in 2011, sat down and, and spent a lot of time coming up with goals that we'd like to accomplish as a council and as a city. Those have been modified. Those were set up in 2012, modified in 2013. And, and we continue to look at those goals as the strategic roadmap for the council. Um, We've done some fine tuning and tinkering. We used to have 10 what they called uh, priorities and goals. We kind of lumped them together. We, we've parsed that down to uh, six priority categories with goals underneath the priorities because, as I said last time, a goal is something specific, has specific timelines, somebody in charge, right. and a budgetary issue, and a priority is a much more macro category. For example, you know, priority number one is public safety and traffic control. Well, that's that's a priority for us. Public safety is always a priority, and as I've always said, too, infrastructure is priority number two. But underneath uh, those priorities are specific goals, and I won't get into all of those here, but uh, uh, they're on the website. We did ratify it at the last meeting. We also finalized our mission statement, our vision statement, our core value statement, which are the macro guiding principles of the mm -hmm. city. Uh, so we, we've really spent a lot of time fine-tuning these goals, and it gives us a roadmap. And, you know, we're, if, you know, it's several pages long, and we, we probably won't get to all of them, but it does give us something to strive for. So are you, are you done with this goal-setting exercise Goal-setting is done. It's Done complete. and approved. Yeah, that's well, it. I think as I watch the council meetings and listen, the one thing it seems is the way you're approaching it is at least to have, it's nice to say you want to do all these things, but you're really structuring it so that it's, you can measure this. That Absolutely. you are setting sort of deadlines and timelines. Well, and interesting enough you say that. I, mean, I don't think you've even seen this yet, but who's it assigned to, respond by respond by date, assigned to. So we're, we're, we really do want to measure these things and, and have uh, specific timelines where, um, you know, that's, that's really the only way you can progress in anything. If you don't have a timeline, it's just going to fall by the wayside. And having a consultant work with you, did you find that really helpful? We did. It was there, there was a couple a couple bumps through the process, <laughs> but he did he did a really good job, and, and ultimately we came up with a very fine product, in my opinion. Good, yeah. good. Um, every meeting, and by the way, for our residents watching and the people in the community, our, our city council and RPV meets the first and third Tuesday of the month, and always encourage you to come on down. And it's absolutely, a, it's fun, great. fun it's being there. <laughs> it's great. It's wonderful. You really feel like you're in the know, or at least watch it on RPV TV. But um, there's always the public comment period at the beginning, and I always find it interesting, you know, you have every kind of topic that's going to come up. Mm -hmm. And the last one, you had a lot of people come up, they talked about the debate right now in our community over Common Core, which is a school district issue, yet right. it's, it affects our whole community. I mean, residents here are paying quite a bit of taxes into the school district, so they need to be in the know. But you had all these people get up and talk about Common Core, then you had someone get up and talk about border issues in San Pedro, about with Rancho PG and then also the California Coast Specific Plan. So you'll hear all these interesting conversations come mm -hmm. up. And then I always think, well, what happens with those comments? And where, where, where do you, how does this really get built into maybe there's some actual action taken? Sure, well, the, the public comment section is for items not on the agenda, and that gives members of the public and interested parties the ability to come in, come up and get their three minutes and, and um, bring forth an idea or a concern uh, for the council, and the council obviously can't take action because it's not agendized at that point, but if a council person finds merit or a hand, you know, more than one council person finds merit in that argument, they can bring that forward in, in, as a future agenda item or talk to the city attorney if there's another channel that that might be brought forward. I'm sorry, the city manager, uh, if there's something already in the offing with respect to an agenda item. Um, but, you know, those three issues that you talked about, first of all, Common Core, uh, and the Rancho uh, LPG tanks um, obviously do affect us very much. You got obviously the you know 
Rancho Palos Verdes residents, the school district is known as being excellent and, you know, very, very uh, um, high caliber in the state of California and nationally. But, uh, you know, there's this conversion to Common Core, and I'm, I'm, I have just enough knowledge to be scary on the issue. <laughs> but the, uh, the, there is a lot of concern, and there are two very passionate sides to this debate. And the, the uh, anti, if I can call them that, anti-Common Core group came out um, in force and basically asked us to be wary of several things. And I won't get into all the detail on what they were asking us and, and telling us to be, be careful of. But the bottom line is we don't have any jurisdiction over that issue. Mm -hmm. We can have our personal opinions. Uh, I'm not really sure if it's appropriate as a council. Um, you know, I think somebody asked for a resolution and, and uh, uh, whether that really is appropriate for, for the council to do because there is a, another governing body that was voted in to deal with those issues. Mm -hmm. um, but again, on the Rancho LPG tanks, the, you have two 12.5 million gallon tanks that have uh, uh, liquefied butane um, that if there was a tragedy of some sort that would it would be horrific and we do have RPV residents down on the bottom of Strathmore uh, that are probably between a quarter mile and a half mile away and then right up Westmont into the um, rolling hills Riviera uh, you know 720 homes there and that's probably less than a mile away would be my guess so it, it obviously impacts us but again we don't have jurisdiction there uh, this council was very interested in that particular topic and we have taken it under advisement. Uh, we do have a gentleman uh, asking for a resolution and we'll see where that goes. Again, I'm not sure if that's appropriate or not and, and I haven't really digested or looked into that yet, but we will. But isn't the big question too, like if something happens, like who's responsible for people affected in Rancho Palos Verdes? You know, we, we had... We had the Terms representative, no, I know. Well, we had the represent, several representatives of Rancho come and speak to us. And, and one of the things that was disconcerting to me was, you know, they talked about the fact that they had insurance. And then I asked them for a copy of the insurance and they said they would bring it forward. And then shortly thereafter, we got a letter from their attorney and said that's uh, um, confidential and proprietary information and they weren't going to release it. And the, the, the story goes on a little bit more than that. I wasn't overly thrilled with that response. Um, but, you know, insurance is a big issue, the, the corporate structure as to who's ultimately liable and something like that, and just the safety issue. It's, it's you know, again, I have my personal opinions um, on, on whether that should be there or not, but collectively as a council, I don't think we have jurisdiction. I know we don't have jurisdiction, but whether or not we do anything other to, to opine on that on behalf of the residents, we'll have to see. But would you say collectively as a council, you think you understand and really think that these residents are bringing concerns that are legitimate? I think they're very legitimate. I think that, you know, I would, you know, and I'll tell you, let me say this. I have my mother, two sisters, nephews, um, all within a half mile. And my mother lives in Arbor, she lives in Strathmore. And mm -hmm. I've got another sister that lives right there by Taper. And I got one that lives in the gardens and that's right there. So, you know, God forbid something happens, it would be catastrophic for the Dovic family. Um, right. So it's, uh, and those things do happen. You know, I don't need to enumerate the list of things that happened, but San Bruno and West Virginia and all these different, down in Texas, I think it was in Wichita, these things, you know, fertilizer plants blown up and things happen. But are so. you getting the feel, because obviously it's not in your jurisdiction, but it's in, um, you know, first, like, uh, the city councilman of L.A., Joe, um, Joe Buscaino. Is he feeling like he hears you, and is he I think he advocate? hears us. I think, I think there, you know, it was interesting. I attended a meeting on that particular issue where, where Joe invited all the different jurisdictions that had some, some sort of input into the uh, uh, inspection and approvals and all these different things. There was like 15 different agencies and everyone was kind of going like this, you know, and uh, um, but what has happened though is count, uh, Congressman Waxman and Councilwoman, uh, Council, she was a former, former Councilwoman, Congress Congresswoman Janice Hahn, Hahn. Yep. Janice Hahn have both um, latched on might be a strong word, but they're involved in this issue now and they're they're looking into it and they're they're I think uh, Congresswoman Hahn wants to actually have hearings on site over here, and she's brought it in front of various um, agencies on the Hill to look at. So hopefully, hopefully it gets some redress and, and that they do something there, because I am concerned about it, to be honest with you. Okay, and I'm sure you'll continue to hear this come up at council meetings. So Absolutely. We'll pay close attention always to that issue. Again, one last, one last thing, public comment period. Um, we had a resident that came up and was concerned about 
the California Coastal or Coast Specific Plan and violations and um, I myself. That's the RPV Coastal Specific right. Plan. So, right. so what does all that mean in terms of what was the concerns about violations and all that? Yeah, well, the concern is that that's a governing document that uh, that deals with uh, development and usage uh, in what is defined as the the the. Uh, coastal area in Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, and, and there are a lot of different agencies that govern the California Coastal Commission. And we also have this plan that was approved by them many, many years ago. And the concern there was we have a resident uh, um, that has a lot that wants to build a home. And uh, there is a, a fairly decent sized contingent that is concerned about the view impairment from this home. It's actually on right down the street from here, Palos Verdes Drive West. Um, so the, the concern is people walking on the trails and people driving by are going to lose sight of the ocean. And that's really what brought this forward. There's a, you know, there's a concern that we're going to wind up being like uh, Malibu or Santa Monica where you drive down the street and you, you can't see the ocean in a lot mm -hmm. of different places. And I, and I hear that concern and I'm very sensitive to that concern. So much so that I asked staff to come back with a report on the coastal specific plan. Okay. Uh, to because since I've been on council and I've been a council watcher for a number of years prior to me joining the council, uh, never really heard a lot about it. wasn't briefed on it. Don't know uh, what the parameters are or how it affects our ability to make decisions. And and we and, I'm, and I asked him. I want to know the history behind it. Uh, how is it affected? Who has input to it? Are we, are we limited in what we can do based on that document? And the big issue, again, that was brought forward in public comment was how is that being interpreted? And, and what kind of how's leeway? How's it being enforced? How's it being enforced? <laughs> Not only enforced, but the, the more, I'm hearing more interpreted. And there's, there's, there, I think there's some subjectivity there for both the planning commission and the council. And I want to get clarity on that. Uh, as to what tools we have available to us on such an item so as this. In terms of a timeline, when do you expect staff will get back with um, I met I met with the city manager talking about uh, future um, agendas, and I asked her to move that forward very quickly. So and I'm we gonna, bring up city manager, acting city manager Carolyn Petru. Right. What's happening with the search now for a new city manager? Well, um, the the process is in full swing. Um, we have selected a city manager recruitment firm selection ad hoc subcommittee and that's a big <laughs> mouthful um, but basically they we the, that committee has met and they're working with Sean Robinson who's head of HR um, they've put together a statement of qualification and proposal for um, eight recruitment firms that are specifically involved and, and specialists in that area they put that out on the I believe it was February 11th uh, and ask them to reply if they're interested in throwing their company's hat into the ring for consideration by the 26th of February. Um, and then at that point, who, the, the companies and the, the individuals who respond on behalf of those companies will be invited for an interview and there'll be recommendations made by the uh, subcommittee and the entire council and hopefully we can select one of those firms. Um, but again, this is, this is step one. And, if you go back and look at the staff report, the timeline, even you know, at best, they're they're stating that it's probably going to be a seven-month process. So mm -hmm. this, there's one month right there. We brought this forward. I think it was on the fourth, and you know, submissions are the 26th, so we're going to be one month in before we even get to a firm that's going to assist us with this recruitment well, this process. Is, it will be an, is an incredible city to hold a job in managing, and I'm sure is. I think I heard. I don't know whether it was. I don't remember who said it during the council meeting, but they expect, I mean, nationwide, you're going to have people that are interested Absolutely. in being able to manage this city. Well, who wouldn't want to be the city manager <laughs> of RPV? You're right. It's uh, paradise here, and uh, you get to be their boss. You get to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we won't open up that Pandora's box. We won't. But. Um, and um, on the subject of city employees, uh, I don't know if you want to re reference the last meeting. You were very excited that you come up with an MOU with the Employees Association. What does that mean now? And when will you get all that sort of right. coming together? Yeah, the last meeting we did, in fact, ratify the MOU, and that's that, that had to happen after the um, union, the uh, employee union ratified. And we've been talking about that for it's, it's well over a year now, and there was some discussion as to the MOU, again, just for uh, everybody's understanding, is a memorandum of understanding, which is basically what is the current uh, status quo um, situation with respect to compensation, uh, employee uh, benefits, work conditions, grievance conditions, et cetera. What are the policies and procedures? How does the city interact with the employees? And once they formed a union, 
Um, at that point in time, everything stopped. Whatever was in place at that point in time, whether it was codified or not, written down, or if it was just a practice, um, that is where any changes or any negotiations need to begin. That's so your baseline. That's the baseline. So this is where we were on February, I think it was actually October 11th of 2011 when they, when they actually formed. I think we ratified in May or June of 2012. So once the agency was sanctioned at that point in time, um, whatever it was, it was, and, and now we move forward. If they have things that they'd like to bring forward to, to have changed or bargain over, um, they'll have the ability to do that, as will the council. Okay. We only have a couple minutes left here. We, oh, haven't, only, wow. we haven't even got on to the um, other goodness. exciting meeting that you had, which was to discuss your infrastructure uh, report card. We can also talk about this at great length. It could be a show in itself coming up through because there's a lot going on. I think it should but just, be. It kind of just give an overview so the residents know it's airing on our channel that meeting, which was February 11th. I saw 11th. that, yeah. as a matter of fact. Yeah. So just give them a, just an overview of what, what took place at that meeting, and then they can stay tuned, and we can do a, a whole show on this. Sure. Thing. At the infrastructure workshop, it was, it was basically broken down into three areas. We had an, an infrastructure report card, which was step one, uh, and section one of the presentation. Uh, next, which was basically phase two, which is the uh, infrastructure management plan, the IMP, as it's affectionately called. Um, that is not a W before that. And then the third, the third, yeah, <laughs> there's, you could put a lot of letters in front of that. But anyway, the, um, the, uh, the third part was potential financing. And, and this meeting was designed to be very, very broad in nature. Um, I think I had heard uh, there was a bit of discontent and, and some thought it was going to be much more explicit in nature. Um, but this was step one, and I think it served its purpose. Um, really what this was to bring forward, again, the report card is on a very macro level, um, you know, 50,000 foot, where are we based on the opinions of experts in this area, uh, using various guidelines for, uh, for lack of a better term, grading or, or rating of our infrastructure. And there were eight categories there, you know, buildings, parks, trails, sewers, drains, and uh, I don't have all the, right. all the explicit categories in front of me, but it was eight categories. But for example, in the report card, A for trails, D for buildings, but what does all that really mean and how do you get the report card? That's a whole other story. Sure. Well, no, that, that is the report card. And again, it was designed to be a very macro level and it's subjective because we, we hired a consultant to come in and do this. The work papers um, I'm, were to be, his work papers were to be posted on the website because there really was very little supportive documentation at the meeting. And I think that might have frustrated some people, but it was right. voluminous and it's going to be posted on the website. Um, but, but really more so, you got to take it to the next step. The actual infrastructure management plan is where a lot of that detail is coming. Um, this, the, the first part, the report card, subjective, somebody's opinion based on their expertise and, and guidance from various uh, rating agencies and what have you. But really the infrastructure management plan uh, which is very cutting edge and, and cities of our size normally don't have something like that is my understanding and I haven't seen it but that gets into the, the detail and the minutia it talks about um, you know where are we with a particular category let's call it storm drains and, and one information it, it, it brings all that information together in one central place and talks about uh, where we are what needs to be done uh, how does this interplay with other things that may need to be done in conjunction with the building replacement or what have you and how are you going to finance it? So that the plan puts that all together in one global macro place. So, so we as a city and, and as a council can make intelligent decisions with respect mm -hmm. to infrastructure. And the subject of financing a project, I know if there was some talk at that meeting with the people that were there about wanting to know more about how you're going to finish dealing with the San Ramon financing, that $20 million project of $10 million, which you got the state grant for. Right. And so when will we know more about that, that financing? That's coming, uh, if, if not the next meeting, the one right after that. It's coming up in very short okay, order. So we'll uh, you know, San Ramon is, is going to be completed in April, but we, we had a, uh, um, we have the ability to go back, I think we have till June or July, if we want to finance a, a, all of it or a portion of it. Um, we, we, we have a resolution that allows us to do that. So, okay. But these, the specifics of San Ramon and what the options are and the cost of money and, and all that's going to be, it'll be its own separate meeting. That was much more of a global macro, here's all your things that, that you have at your fingertips for financing. Well, thanks for being here next month. We'll catch, catch up with you in March. You can keep us what's up to date on what's going on. And for that, I'm Liz Brown Swanson here with Mayor Jerry Dehovic on RPV City Talk. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.